that you've turned to the dark side. That you killed younglings. Now, what's important to remember is that Anakin is an adolescent. The most recent studies show that adolescence ends maybe in the mid-20s, so some of his behavior might be developmentally appropriate. Granted, killing younglings is never acceptable. That is not normal behavior. Hey, GQ. I'm Dr. Eric Bender, and this is The Breakdown. American Psycho. Anti-aging eye balm followed by final moisturizing protective lotion. There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman. Patrick's routine at first, it seems like something you might see in GQ, a 20 step process to look your best for the day. What we actually see more of here though is his narcissism, the way he's describing it. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna use this. There's that preoccupation with beauty that he's gonna look a certain way. What I find very interesting about him is that he knows what he is. And from Dr. Martin's interactions with Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Nielsen, we know that psychopaths are aware that they function differently than other people. He's saying, I have this mask and this mask you see, and that doesn't tell you anything about me. I'm holding my cold stare behind or my coldness inside. That is very true. You get more into philosophical arguments here about what do we see on the outside? Do we really know what somebody thinks, what they do? We really don't. You only can go by what you see and what someone tells you. So there is a version of a Patrick Bateman. There's a mask, it's very symbolic here. He peels off this mask. He knows there's things behind this mask. It's almost like there's two masks. He creates a mask for everybody to see. He can peel off the mask himself, no one else can, of what's behind all that. His own psychopath inside. He peels the mask off and reveals that. The mask he peels off right here, he's revealing just an outer shell to everybody else. And though I can hide my cold gaze, and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable, I simply am not there. Many of Patrick's escapades, shall we say, in the movie, are around narcissistic injury. The idea that he's perceived someone telling him he's done something wrong or that someone has scolded him in some way or hurt his ego, how he feels about himself. That drives a lot of his behavior. And that actually falls more in line with the narcissist and more in line with the psychopath. Star Wars, episode three, Revenge of the Sith. I am becoming more powerful than any Jedi has ever dreamed of. And I'm doing it for you to protect you. Come away with me. So here you see Anakin Skywalker, and he's showing traits of a personality disorder. A personality disorder refers to how someone interacts with the world around them. If it's vastly different from the cultural norm, it could be a personality disorder, meaning that person experiences life and interactions with other people and relationships very differently than the norm. These could be elements of psychopathy. Psychopathy is a personality construct. It's the idea that certain personality traits combined with behavior create a psychopath. What a psychopath is or what psychopathy represents is someone who is callous, uncaring, does not feel emotion for other people, but just uses people as pawns to gain what they want. That can sometimes combine with narcissism or traits of narcissism and that callousness and uncaring can combine. And you can see that someone just goes ahead and does whatever they want. So that question is here, is Anakin a psychopath? It's important to note that people with narcissistic traits and narcissistic personality disorder, people with borderline personality disorder, other personality disorder traits are not psychopaths. It's not necessarily that someone has a borderline personality disorder, therefore they are violent. It's very important to note that mental illness is very rarely associated with violence. The traits of narcissism and borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder have been talked about in terms of psychopathy and how when those traits pair with the callousness and the uncaring and the unemotional side that someone can have, that's when things become very dangerous. It's very important to note that people with mental illness are not inherently dangerous. No! You're with him! You brought him here to kill me! No! Let her go, Anakin! So we're seeing traits of borderline personality disorder. The term borderline actually refers to the idea of walking on the border between psychotic, where there's a break from reality, and neurotic, where someone's really trying to manage the chronic distress and anxiety that they feel. 
Someone with borderline personality disorder or traits of it might show chronic feelings of emptiness. They might have an identity disturbance, not feeling like there's a stable sense of self. Here, he's, was he a Jedi? Was he a Sith? He's, he's questioning that. Now he seems to be more towards the Sith world. Someone with borderline personality disorder also makes frantic efforts to avoid any abandonment, whether it's real or perceived. Here, he's perceiving Padme not wanting to do this as abandonment, and he's frantically trying to kill her. He's also going to go up against Obi-Wan Kenobi as another way to avoid this abandonment. That's his response. People with borderline traits can also show impulsivity or intense anger that's inappropriate. And that could mean constantly being angry or almost having tantrums. We see that here in Anakin. Now, what's important to remember is that Anakin is an adolescent. The most recent studies show that adolescence ends maybe in the mid-20s. The brain really doesn't develop fully until the mid-20s, recent research is showing. So some of his behavior might be developmentally appropriate as he's actually coming into his teen years and becoming a young adult. Granted, killing younglings is never acceptable. That is not normal behavior. So that raises a red flag in my head, but this has to be considered, his age. As a child psychiatrist, that's something I'm considering too. I'm also wondering here about his background. Has he had difficulty attaching to people? So think about how he was pulled away from his mother. His mother died. He has a fear of Padme dying like his mother died. So that was an issue. And his mother was also sold into slavery. He didn't grow up in the greatest environment. Love won't save you, Padme. Only my new powers can do that. At what cost? You're a good person. Don't do this. I won't lose you the way I lost my mother. The question of psychopathy, I come back in my mind to episode six in Return of the Jedi, the very end where Darth Vader heaves the Emperor into the towers and into the electrical storm that he falls and plummets to his death in. In that sense, Anakin is showing that he really does care for his family, his son, for Luke. It's not about him at that point. It's really about his child. And that is unusual for a psychopath to have that level of love. Recent research shows that psychopaths do actually feel emotion, but it's typically when it comes to them achieving the goal that they want to achieve. So the level of love that Darth Vader shows for Luke in Return of the Jedi really makes me think he's not a psychopath. You also have to consider the developmental age of Anakin at this time. I can't say for sure as a forensic psychiatrist that this person meets criteria on the psychopathy checklist, which is a list of personality traits and behaviors that suggest someone is a psychopath. I can't say that for sure here because there's still the development of the young person. However, there are a lot of clues that he's on that way or on a path to becoming a psychopath. Later, there is that choice Anakin or Darth Vader makes to save his son. There is some choice. Now, maybe there was something that Darth Vader picked up on in that scene. I think we're led to believe that there was a big change of heart. Uh, somewhat that's Hollywoodized, but there is this love that comes through. And I think that's what makes it clear that he's not a psychopath. In psychopathy, the studies show that you can decrease behavior. You can use medication sometimes even to decrease impulsivity, but you wouldn't necessarily teach someone to love more. We have the benefit now of knowing in episode six, something changes. So I can say that Darth Vader is not a psychopath. Looking at the Emperor would be a bit different. Silence of the Lambs. Have a go. You're so close to the way you're gonna catch him. Do you realize that? No, tell me why. After your father's murder, you were orphaned. What happened next? Dr. Lecter is in fact a psychopath. He's someone who doesn't really care about people. You can tell already, even in the way he interacts with Clarice, there is this back and forth, but it's really for his benefit. He says, it'll be very interesting to learn about your upbringing. And then he asks her about these very traumatic times in her life. He wants that for his own personal gratification. Quid pro quo, doctor. Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is, he tries to be. He's tried to be a lot of things I expect. Clarice comes back to him and says, quid pro quo. So I'll give you something, you give me something. This for that. She's also playing on his narcissism. She's calling him doctor. She never calls him Hannibal. She calls him doctor all the time, playing up to that. Narcissistic traits in a psychopath often reflect a demand for a certain respect or certain praise. That's what goes on here. We see that in their exchange. 
Now, you said that I was very close to the way we would catch him. What did you mean, Doctor? There are three major centers for transsexual surgery, Johns Hopkins, the University of Minnesota, and Columbus Medical Center. I wouldn't be surprised if Billy had applied for sex reassignment at one or all of them and been rejected. Some people would argue that Dr. Lecter is not a psychopath. Some people argue that maybe he shows some kindness towards Clarice in his own distinct way. Psychopaths don't have to feel absolutely nothing. There's a study that looked at psychopaths and whether they could feel regret. And that study showed that psychopaths had regret for things they did that caused them to not win as much money in this exercise in the study or to lose a lot of money. What was unique about the people who scored high on the psychopathy checklist was that they didn't use that regret to make future decisions. It wasn't that they lost something or didn't gain enough, so therefore they should think differently in the future. It was about regretting that moment, the retrospective regret, looking back. They couldn't use that information to look forward or prospectively. So the idea is that psychopaths can in fact feel some regret or have some feeling, but it's really about them and their goal. It's not necessarily outside. A psychopath could care for a person or a family member, but again, only to that end of wanting to have that family or wanting to have that person in their life for a certain achievement or goal. There was a psychologist who worked with the BTK killer and that person even said in multiple letters to her that he really did understand that his crimes affected his family and he asked that his family be left out of any type of research she was doing as she communicated with him. So I think in this case, Dr. Lecter is a psychopath, even if he feels something, because we've seen from research, psychopaths can in fact feel things. Quid pro quo, doctor. What's interesting about the camera angle here is you see the reflection of Dr. Lecter in the glass where Clarice is looking at him. First, what this scene does is it draws you into the world of Dr. Lecter. You're fascinated, and that's true of psychopaths. They can be very charming, and they can be really interested in you, so it seems, but it's really only to their end. In a psychopath, you never know what you're gonna get. They're pathologically lying, so you don't know who it is that you see. You often see a reflection of somebody, but who is it and what's behind that? The question of whether Clarice Starling or an FBI agent would talk to a psychopath or a serial killer himself in order to find out more about a case, it might be Hollywood plot driving, but at the same time, it is possible because in trying to look for offenders, a forensic psychiatrist, for instance, who's not an FBI agent, would look at all the records possible. There might be multiple interviews of people. Dr. Lecter has intimate knowledge of Billy here, so the FBI will, in fact, use what sources they can to understand and try to solve a case, particularly when there are active murders going on. You. I'm sorry. You sound apologetic. Like you're embarrassed to be a good girl, and you murmur your first word to me. Hello. We come to find out that this character is a serial killer. Just because he's a serial killer doesn't mean that he can't have other obsessions or other mental health issues. In this case, it's, it's not a mental health issue like depression or anxiety, although serial killers can have those things. Here, this makes me think of stalking. Do you work here? Guilty. Can I help you find something? Paula Fox? It's a good choice. Mm, I feel weirdly validated. There are different types of stalking. You can have rejected stalking, which is when someone's been rejected in some way, there's a divorce, they've been terminated from work, and, and therefore they start to stalk somebody. There can also be predatory stalking, where you're stalking someone with the idea of spying on them to eventually assault them in some way. You can also have erotomanic stalking, which is the idea that you've realized this person is meant to be with you and you think that they're in love with you and you're in love with them. You can also have the incompetent suitor type of stalking where someone is fixated on a person and believes that they're going to be involved in this person's life and that person's going to be their lover, but that person's not even available. They're, they're someone married or someone who's involved in something else. You can also have what's called the resentful stalker, where someone is stalking someone or going after them in a way just to derive pleasure from distressing them or, or trying to get them upset. In this case, I wonder, because we're privy to his thoughts and know that he's stalking this woman in some way, is it erotomanic? Is he thinking that there's a love relationship here between the two of them? 
Or is it predatory? Is he planning to attack her in some way? Is he planning to do something to her? Given that he's a serial killer, we, we don't know. But it is possible that a serial killer could have a relationship. Just because you're a serial killer doesn't mean you wouldn't have a relationship with other people. In fact, some serial killers have these secret lives. They're married, they have kids, but on the side at night when no one knows, they go out and they hunt for victims. Oh, are you not wearing a bra? And you want me to notice. If this was a movie, I'd grab you and we'd go at it right in the stacks. Have you read her fiction? A psychopath might want a relationship with somebody, but typically they're getting something out of it. It's about them. It's not gonna be about providing for that other person. It's gonna be about what that person does for them. Maybe they wanna be a father and maybe they're gonna to try to be with somebody who wants to have children. Maybe they want to have sex, but it really is about what that person wants. Blue Velvet. We see the use of substances, actually. He's huffing on gas, some kind of substance that's clearly making him high. When someone is high, we do see behaviors that can vacillate between a very happy mood, a very sad mood, anger. It can all come out at one time or, or in this what's called labile mix of things, labile going back and forth. So he's at one minute almost sobbing for his mommy, and another minute he's very angry, and he's talking about, in a very angry way, what he's gonna do. He could be a sexual sadist as well, meaning that he's deriving pleasure from the humiliation and the suffering and the pain of his victim. In this case, he punches her, tells her not to look at him, he's humiliating her, he's hurting her, he seems to be getting off on this. He's also sold this woman's husband and child into slavery, so there really does seem to be some kind of pleasure he gets out of hurting other people. He doesn't care about other people, he cares about himself. So he's clearly a psychopath in this case. Mommy loves you. Baby wants to fuck. Get ready to fuck! Psychopaths don't have to have a component of sexual action or sexual behavior in their acts. We think of serial killers and often there is a sexual motivation there. Not necessarily though. Sometimes it's just about the killing. It's not about sex. It's not about sexual pleasure. That really brings in that element of sexual sadism when it becomes more about sexual arousal. You can have psychopaths who are motivated by other things, whether it's killing, whether it's financial greed, or just hurting people, toying with people. It doesn't have to be a sexual motivation. Misery. Well, it's brilliantly written, but then everything you write is brilliant. Pretty rough stuff. So the swearing, Paul. Annie might be the original toxic superfan here, the original troll. Instead of having an online platform, she actually has the author here in front of her. She gets quite upset with what he's written, the profanity, and spills soup all over the place as she gets so worked up over it. And in the bank do I tell Mrs. Bollinger, oh, here's one big bastard of a check. Give me some of your Christing money. There, look there. See what you made me do? When I think of Annie, I think of the stalking behavior and the particular type of stalking behavior called that of an incompetent suitor. Someone who, despite having poor social skills or potentially even some social skills, has a fixation on someone and feels like that person is meant for them and that person has raised their interest in love. That person often is in a relationship or, or not available and clearly that's the case here. Annie's not gonna marry this author, but she is treating him in some stalking type of way. We're starting to see an escalation here where she's developing an attachment to him. It's been said that Annie has borderline personality disorder or traits of that. People with borderline personality traits can show a frantic attempt to avoid abandonment by someone. And in some ways, she might be so frantic here that she's going to correct him and give him lessons on how to write so that he will even stay there. Oh, so sometimes I get so worked up. Can you ever forgive me? Fine. Might be that in her mind, she's planning out a way to keep him there. We know later she does horrific things to keep him there. So that could be a trait of borderline personality disorder. People with borderline personality traits often have relationships that vacillate between 
all good or idealized and all bad or totally devalued. And that can be called splitting. She's doing that here. He's the greatest author and then he's the worst author because he uses profanity in a way that's not realistic. But then she loves him again. So she's back and forth on that. The idea that she might have bipolar disorder, you look for specific criteria for bipolar disorder. People often colloquially use the word bipolar to mean hot and cold or switching moods back and forth. It's very different when it comes to psychiatry. A bipolar disorder means that someone has had a manic episode, meaning that for five to seven days, they've had an increased amount of energy to the point that they're potentially grandiose. They're thinking that they're gonna accomplish and do things, write the next great novel, change the course of humanity, play God, know God. They might feel like their thoughts are going all over the place and racing. They're not sleeping because of an increased energy. They might not need any sleep for this five to seven day period. They're on top of the world. In addition, they might be doing things that are a change from baseline. They might be gambling or having sex with multiple people, doing things that are not necessarily safe or good for them. We don't see this necessarily as a change from her baseline, so I can't say that she has a bipolar disorder. I love you, Paul. M your mind. There's still that justification with Annie of why she's doing what she does to Paul. The question of how can she go this far, she's got some justification in her mind. And she does seem to be very psychopathic in what she does here. She's justifying it though because she loves him. She's saying all of this. Now, that doesn't mean she's not psychopathic because she's justifying it, but the fact that she has to find some way to justify it, to me that might be more on the antisocial spectrum as opposed to a psychopath. However, if she didn't care about anybody at all, if this were beyond just him, then I would think, okay, maybe there's more of a psychopathic trait. Here, it's a fixation on him. So is there something particularly obsessive about him? Is there a fixation? Is there some kind of delusion that this person is meant for her? That could be a psychotic delusion. Most stalkers actually don't have psychotic delusions. Some do though. Thanks so much for watching these clips with me. Stay tuned for part two.